Islamophobia is a real issue, and many may try to ignore it, but the fact is that it's present in the, life of, in the lives of many, many Muslims across the world. How would you feel and how would you react if someone called you a terrorist or a towel head? It's not easy to deal with such insults that come at you. And the fact is, is that many of us, me, you, or a friend or a family member or someone across the world who has experienced this insults or such, such uh, insults. Now, how do we deal with it? The only way we deal with it is to actually deal with it. Uh, that's the solution uh, to uh, Islamophobia. How do we do that? We'll continue watching today for we are joined with a very special guest who is here to talk about how do we deal with Islamophobia, whether we live in the East or we live in the West. It is Sayyid Hussain Qazwini. So, Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidna. Alaikum assalam How are you? Alhamdulillah. Allah khalikum, inshallah. Well. Allah islamkum. Uh, Sayyidna, um, can we begin by sending our salams as usual Absolutely. and then we can continue our discussion? Absolutely. Allah khalikum. Assalamu alaikum, ya Aba Abdullah. وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم إني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين والسلام على أخيه أبي الفضل العباس قمر العشيرة وباب الحوائج السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Respected viewers, once again, Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We do welcome you to the third episode of Deal With It with me, your host, Ahmed Ali. Now, for the dear viewers who are just tuning in for the first time, you can visit our YouTube channel at Imam Hussein 3 TV to view the previous episodes. We are live on Facebook and uh, the phone calls are ready to be received, as well as your comments and questions revolving around how to deal with Islamophobia. This will be discussed with my dear and honorable guest, Sayyid Hussain Qazmini. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidina. Alaykum as How are you? Alhamdulillah. Allah khalikum, inshaAllah. Allah salam. The past few nights, uh, we have been celebrating the birth of Imam Hussain. Uh, we talked uh, about uh, social media and dangers of social media on uh, the night of his birthday. And yesterday, we talked about early marriage. And today, uh, we chose to talk about dealing with Islamophobia. Now, as a person who has been living in the West uh, and really experienced what went on, uh, in, uh, on 9-11 and post 9-11 and what happened earlier in the West um, a lot of people began to be scared of Muslims have the tension to always you know not be friends with Muslims you know to keep away from them um, so how do we deal with Islamophobia the first question that comes to mind is why is why, why does it exist to what extent do we actually go to realize that, you know, to overlook our differences and look at our similarities? A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa Sallallahu Ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa Alihi Tayyibin Al-Tahirin. I remember 9-11 uh, very vividly. I remember exactly what happened and what I did on that day. It was... You know, uh, it was a normal day. Mm -hmm. I would get up early in the morning to go to college. 
And I remember it was my second year in college. Uh, I got up early in the morning and without watching the news, I got in my car and I drove and I turned on the radio to hear that two twin towers in New York you know, have been attacked by airplanes and they've fallen. But we don't know who's done it. Obviously, you know, you could tell that I mean, uh, it's unplanned and yeah. everything. Yeah. No, it's, it's going to be terrorists. Who? Yeah, Muslim uh, terrorists. terrorists. Yeah, anyways. So I wasn't sure. Should I go to college? Should yeah. I not go to college? Should I stay home? What should I do? What's, what, what, what's going to be the reaction to this incident? Is someone going to attack me? Am I going to get arrested? I went to school. And that day, not a lot of people showed up. And I remember it was an anthropology class. Mm-hmm. Instead of talking about anthropology, the teacher decided to talk about 9-11 well, and what happened and what are the possible you know, scenarios, who did it, why did they do it, and what's next. For me, that was the start of Islamophobia. Of course, I, w- I was still young. I was maybe 18, 18 or 19. Islamophobia had started before that. What it's not something new. Yeah. It had started before that. But I think that 9-11 was a turning point. If Islamophobia had existed, it wasn't as strong as it was after 9-11. Yes. 9-11 came and changed everything. Yes. It changed the entire world view. Not just people in America, people in, in Canada. I'm yeah. pretty sure you could relate. Oh, yeah. I'm assuming you were in Canada yeah, yeah, yeah. during 9-11. People in, in Europe, everywhere. These crazy Muslims As- are crazy enough to take, yeah. you know, hijack four planes and drive them into a building. Drive them into, That's what a, yeah. a typical non-Muslim American or European or Canadian would think and it started of course it was not easy and I I remember I remember some people that were living in the United States they said it's time for us to leave we yeah. are we are no longer welcome here a lot of people were attacked yeah they said you know what yeah. we should, we, that day I remember from my family no one left the house wow especially the females who wear hijab they were asked to remain at home for several days we only left for, for necessities and for emergency yeah. cases. Otherwise, we didn't leave the house because we didn't know what, what is going to be the reaction. Obviously, there was going to be a, an immense hatred and fear of Islam. Islamophobia is fear of Islam. Yeah. Um, of course, the backlash wasn't as bad as we expected. On the contrary, I remember that a lot of churches opened their doors for Muslims. They open their doors for religious scholars, Muslim religious scholars. Come and tell us about your religion. Is, does 9-11 represent you? Does it represent all Muslims? Are these actions justifiable mm-hmm. in your faith and religion that you kill random, random people, civilians? There could be children mm-hmm. on those uh, flights. Does your religion encourage this? Um... You know, I think that not everything was negative. To some degree, it was positive. People uh, came to know about Islam. There were so many books published on Islam. There were so many articles. Churches had their their doors open. But at the same time, there were people that were seriously afraid. That were seriously scared of uh, of Muslims. Yeah. And any Muslim is a potential hijacker. Any Muslim is a potential terrorist. Yeah. I remember I was on a flight once from Detroit, Michigan to uh, Florida. And uh, it was during the month of Ramadan. I had spent the first half of Ramadan in Detroit, Michigan. And the second half, I was going to Miami, Florida for the second half of Ramadan. And I was reading a book in Arabic. And no, I'm sorry. It was in English, but it was on Islam. Mm -hmm. I believe it's called The Crisis of Islam Mm -hmm. by Bernard Lewis. I was reading that book and I remember calling my brother on the flight telling him that I am on the flight safely. The passengers sitting next to me, they were an African American couple. Uh, They were frightened. I'm young, I'm speaking Arabic, I have a book called The Crisis of Islam. 
I might have been holding a misbah or reciting prayers as I always do when I ride a plane or a car for safety. These guys assume that, you know. You're about to blow up yourself. Either blow up myself or hijack the plane wow. as soon as it takes off. So the gentleman sitting next to me, he said, Sir, um, I don't know what is it that you've planned or thought of or whatever it is that you're planning on doing. Or maybe you're not planning on doing, but we just want to tell you something. That me and my wife were on a business trip here in Michigan. And we've left our eight-year-old daughter in Florida. And she's waiting for us. Right now we're going, we're going back home to our daughter. Whatever it is that you've planned, just please think about our daughter. Wow. First, I thought he was joking. I thought this guy is, you know... I started laughing, you know, I thought that's the punchline. Mm -hmm. But no, he was not laughing. He was wow. dead serious. And his wife was tense. I told him, are you serious? Are you joking? Just because I'm a young Muslim and I spoke in Arabic and that means I'm going to hijack the plane. What about security? I passed through security. That means I'm not carrying any weapons or bomb on me. I said, I know. I'm so he kept on apologizing. I said, you know what? You, out of all people, you know, I said he was African American. Why? Because African Americans, they're discriminated against. Oh, way in the United more States. than Muslims. Way more than Muslims. You know, a lot of white people, they consider every black person they see as a criminal, as a potential killer, murderer, rapist. I said, How would you like it if I, you know, generalized and told you, please don't rob me? I want you to think of my kids back home. And uh, please don't rob me. Would that be okay with you? Even though a great deal of uh, inmates in the United States are African American. But not a lot of Muslims are terrorists. Anyhow, I don't know if that analogy made sense or not. <laughs> he said, you're right. But I think that he was afraid the whole two hours. He Until was. we got home I mean, safely in Florida, he gave me a hug. He's like, I'm so relieved that we actually landed. And wow. You know, this is not a simple incident. <clears throat> I think a lot of people... A lot of people have been, uh, have been through that. Why? What are the main causes of Islamophobia? You know, this is not something that we could do in 40 minutes, on a 40-minute show. Not. It's something that, you know, researchers have been talking about. They've written articles, books on why the fear of Islam. But I'd like to mention three main reasons. Number one is because there's a group of Muslims, a small minority, who are brainwashed, who are barbarians, yes. who are violent and aggressive. Yes. And they're called Wahhabis. Mm -hmm. They ascribe to the school of thought of Wahhabism, the school of thought of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. This is a strict, fundamentalist school of thought that believes they are God's chosen people, so to speak. They are the only people on the right path. And everyone else are infidels. Sufis are infidels. Shi'is are infidels. If you celebrate the Prophet's birthday, you're an infidel. If you visit these shrines, you're so, an infidel. So basically, 99% of the Muslims. Absolutely. Anyone other than them, Wahhabis. Now they believe that infidels should be killed. And when I say infidels, they mean Shia. Shia are also infidels. Yeah. You know, a lot of times uh, when I get stopped by uh, officials at the airport, and they ask me, where have you been? Have you contacted? Do you know anyone from ISIS? I'm like, guys, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. If ISIS were to see me and you, you as an American officer and me as a Muslim they'll kill me first and then they'll come after you to me, I'm their arch enemy Shias are hated by Wahhabis that's why they kill so much Shia yeah. in Afghanistan in Pakistan in Iraq and you name it these shrines to them these shrines are polytheistic mausoleums that need yes. to be demolished, demolished put yes. to the ground and that's what they did in Baqiyah, in Medina. Yeah. 
and, and what they did in Samara. They tried to do it to the Prophet's grave as well. And if they could, they'd do it to the Prophet's grave. This is an ideological matter. Wahhabis are a, a major source of Islamophobia. Yes. It is because of them that we're, we're paying the price. Me, you, our family members, our friends in the West, any female that wears hijab, anyone that has a beard, even Sikhs for God's sake, even Sikhs are paying the price <laughs> after of the evil of, yeah. of Wahhabism. After 9-11, they burned how many, Sikh, yeah. how many Sikhs were killed and stabbed because wearing a turban and having a long beard, mistaken for a, a Muslim? Wahhabism is a major problem when it comes to Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. It is, they played a major role in spreading fear of Islam. ISIS is only one part of it. We've been dealing with ISIS for, for centuries. For centuries. But people don't know about this. Yeah. Think, they think that ISIS was created a couple of years ago. No, ISIS, you know, existed from the day that Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab announced his movement before that I think. or even even before that even before that even before that so Wahhabism is a major cause but the thing is they take their teachings from Islam don't they they take They're their teachings Muslims. they take their teachings from narrations that they ascribe to Prophet Muhammad they think that Prophet Muhammad said this for example how, how they take a narration that Rasulullah said innama bu'ithu bisayf that I was sent with the sword. Supposedly, allegedly, Rasulullah said this. While the Quran says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have sent you as a mercy. The Prophet says, I was sent by the sword. Do we take the Quran or do we take a, a narration allegedly stated by Rasulullah in Bukhari or Sahih Muslim or in these books? Their, their understanding of Islam is twisted. Their understanding of Islam is distorted. And it's the fault of their scholars have given them this twisted image of uh, Islam. The problem, the problem. I wish it was just a problem, uh, you know, of a couple, a couple of Bedouins in Arabia. No, the problem is that they have major support yeah. by their government, Saudi Arabia, Wahhabism, Wahhabi, Wahhabi clerics, and Al Saud have formed an alliance, a pack, that you scratch my back and I scratch your back. Al Saud want political allegiance from Wahhabis, Wahhabis. Wahhabis want religious allegiance yeah. from Al Saud. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. So this oil rich nation has put its wealth for the use of Wahhabism. That's how Wahhabism has spread in Africa, Nigeria, uh, you name it. Many of the countries in, in Africa, South Africa, uh, and all over Africa, all over Africa, and in Kosovo, in Bosnia, uh, even in Algiers, in mm -hmm. Morocco. Especially, they go to areas where people are less educated, yeah. and they go and they spread in, in Wahhabism. Undeveloped or developing Und countries. Underdeveloped countries. They go and they spread Wahhabism mm -hmm. in those areas. So it's safe to say that basically Islamophobia is within Islam? or I'm it saying that one of the elements of Islamophobia is some Muslims, mm -hmm. as in Wahhabism. Uh -huh. Wahhabis are one of the reasons why Islam Islamophobia has risen. This is one. I said I will mention three. Mm -hmm. I will mention three factors. And the problem is that it, they're not just Bedouins. They're not just Bedouins that are supported by a country. But this country is a Western ally. Supported by the United States of America. And Europe. And is a major Western ally. And they know this. They know that Wahhabism comes from Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is their main ally. Where does ISIS get their ideology from? Where does Al-Qaeda get their ideology from? Where does Boko Haram get their ideology from? And all the other terrorist organizations, all of the other Sunni terrorist organizations, they all stem from Wahhabism. Mm -hmm. their, their ideological you know, mentor is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim Al-Jawzi. These are their, their, their teachers. 
But at the end of the day, they are called Muslims. And one of the facts that we have to face is that they abide by the teachings that are they, Islamic. They are Muslims. So what? The KKK, the Ku, the Ku Klux Klan yeah. are Christians. Yeah. Does that mean that all Christians are guilty of white, that's, white supremacy? That's where I'm trying to get at. See, the problem with us is that, you know, when someone does a good thing, even everywhere across the world, when someone does a good thing, they say, okay, that's good, good job, good, good for you. But when someone does a bad thing, either in a family or a country, the whole family or the whole country or the whole religion is looked at in the same way that they looked at, at that, you know, uh, discrimination or, or what, whatever that person did. Right, right. So it's a problem. So this is a problem. This is one factor. A second factor, um, unfortunately, is that West, some Western politicians, they, they need to create an enemy. Yes. In order to pursue an agenda. How do you get to office? You have to create an enemy. You have to say that they're out there to get us. Mm -hmm. They're going to attack our country. They're going to attack the United States. They're going to attack Europe. So build a wall. <laughs> Let's build a wall. Let's ban Muslims. A complete shutdown, total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the country. You, you create a fear in the yeah. minds of people that there's a, a real enemy and I'm going to protect you. And there's no one else to protect you other than me. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a saying that goes, if you create fear in, in, in the hearts of those you rule, or the citizens, you will rule over them. And that's basically Absolutely. what is happening. And especially if you put yourself as the savior. Yes. That there's no one else that could save you, not these politicians. The only one that has a solution. I'm the only one that has a solution. I'm the only one that could rescue you from the evil of Islam. You need to fear them. There's something. There's something about their book. There's something about the Quran. You know, we hear this yeah. from President Trump uh, and during, the is, during elections. Before Trump. You know, going back to 9-11, if we were to look at it, how many people died? Do you have an account? Like, uh, how many people died? On 9-11? On 9-11. 2,000? 2,000-something. Almost 3,000. Almost 3,000 people died on that day. And Terry Jones comes out burning 2,996 Qur'ans mm. on that day mm. as an anniversary of what happened at the tragic uh, event that happened on 9-11. I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but how stupid to do that when Muslims died in that event as well. So, were, so you burn the Quran there and there were hundreds game. of Muslims that, that worked at the World Trade Center and they died. And this in the, wow. That Comes tells you that real Muslims have nothing to do with it. By the way, you mentioned Terry Jones. Terry Jones had an interview uh, on Fox TV and my older brother, Hassan. Hassan Ghazwini, was yes. part of the interview. I don't know if, you, if you've seen it I've or not. I've seen it, yeah. You know, I want my dear viewers to, after, after they watch this, not while they're watching our show, once you finish, look up, you know, Terry we'll, Jones. We'll be sure to put the link in the description box. Yeah. Terry Jones, Said Ghazwini. Uh, I'm not saying this out of a bias towards my brother, mm -hmm. but he really made not. Terry Jones look like an idiot. Yeah. Because he asked him, that the book that you want to burn, the Qur'an, have you read it? He said, no. But I know enough about it. I don't need to read it. Terry Jones was saying that Islam is against Christianity. The Qur'an is against Christianity. He told him, did you know that the Qur'an that you hate and you think is against Christianity, it has an entire chapter called Mary? And that Jesus has been mentioned so many times in the Qur'an? He said, I didn't know this. He told him, what do you hate about uh, the Quran mm -hmm. he said it promotes do I have to take a break just finish that and then we'll, we'll he said it, it promotes uh, Sharia Allah I said okay what is Sharia Allah when was it exi when did it exist he way said, after Prophet Muhammad came he, he said uh, you know I hate the Quran because it promotes Sharia Allah he said well what is Sharia Allah he said uh, you know like stoning an adulterer and stoning an adulteress my older brother said, Hassan, he told him, L let me give you a fact. The Quran doesn't mention anything about stoning an adulterer or stoning an adulteress. Nothing about stoning. Whipping, yes, but stoning, no. You know which book talks about stoning? The, the Old Bible. Testament, the Bible. 
and he mentioned to him the the chapter yeah. and the verse in the Bible Mary Manglin, yeah. that tells believers to stone adulterers. Yeah. So this is in the Bible, it's not in the Quran. Let's go to a short break and then we can continue that. Uh, very interesting. Respected viewers, uh, do stay tuned for inshallah you presented uh, during the break uh, the blood drive donation which happened in Karbala. So do stay tuned. We'll come back to you shortly. Coinciding with the auspicious birth anniversary of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, and based on the commandments of the Grand Jurist, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq al Husseini Shirazi, may Allah prolong his life, a block donation campaign is held under the slagon of the Master of Giving in the holy city of Karbala. The donation campaign takes place in the main streets, neighboring the holy shrines of Imam Hussein and his brother Abu Fadl Abbas, peace be upon them, on the 3rd of Sha'ban, where the blood donated will be distributed among hospitals to help those who need it, particularly the wounded of the popular mobilization units. The event is organized under the leadership of Grand Ayatollah Shirazi representative Sheikh Abdul Raza Ma'ash. Respected viewers, once again, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We welcome back, uh, we welcome you back uh, to the second part of today's show, uh, where we have been talking about Islamophobia and the causes behind Islamophobia. Now, Sayyidna, uh, Sayyid Hassan Qazwini, um, is joining us once again in tonight's episode. Welcome back, Hayu Sayyidna. Allah khalikum. Now, uh, before the break, just to sum up everything, before we go uh, answering the question, because the majority of the questions we're getting um, is that, yes, we do know what the problem is, tell us what the solution is. Um, a few people did mention a few solutions. Um, so, yeah, and we talked about how from within Islam it came, Islamophobia did exist within Islam, and then but it was powered by some people, you know, motivated by some people, 
outside of Islam. And then we talked about how you know people start to fuel the flame, start to to you know put. There's one more thing that I'd like to add yeah. on, on one of the reasons. Yes. Is, um, that, and that is the media and Hollywood specifically. The media has an, you know, an agenda yeah. to portray. It keeps, you know, uh, it keeps the media industry entertaining. If you don't go after uh, these extremists and cause a threat you know or show th something that's quite small make it big how do you get attention how do you get attention if you've noticed the media as soon as any bomb goes off any incident goes off immediately who is the possible who are the possible perpetrators and one of them is always islam a muslim islam and muslim they they give out the answer before the search has been yeah. already done so the media plays a major role, yes. the way they portray certain events. You know, if it's a Muslim, immediately he's a terrorist. If it's a white guy, he's delusional. Yeah. He has, he has a, psychological problems. Yeah. It's never a Muslim delusional guy, a Muslim guy with psychological problems. No, if it's a Muslim, he's always a terrorist. But if he's white, he's never a terrorist. If he's white, he's always, you know, delusional. He's a lone wolf. He works by himself. He doesn't work as a pack. The, 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 but if it's a Muslim, there's always a pack working on. I don't know if you remember the Virginia attack. The attack that happened in Virginia, uh, where I think the, the, an, an Asian attacked a high school and killed almost 18 students. You know, they they, they called him as psychological problems. Exactly. And they met with his mother and exactly. his teachers. They're, they always I make mean, justifications and and they find solution. They find an uh, ex an excuse for the white guy, yeah. you know, committing an atrocity. But now now with Hollywood. Hollywood plays a major role in the Islamophobia. We see the movies as well. Movies, it's all... The majority all of the there. terrorists are Muslim. The majority of Muslims, the majority of terrorists are Muslims. I remember back in the day when Chuck Norris, wow. uh, you know, f played in these movies yeah. on, on Muslims and hijacking planes and all that. From the early days, from the 80s and from the 90s, Hollywood played, played a major role in Islamophobia, making people scared, scared and fearful of Muslims. So that's also a reality that we have to pay attention to. The media in the West plays a major role in spreading fear against mm -hmm. Islam. Mm -hmm. Now, can we talk about the cure? Mm -hmm. Now, before we go into the cure, uh, I think actually, let's just ask some of the questions. Um, Vicky uh, Sabah, she says, okay, we know what the problem is. We need to start discussing possible solutions. solutions. Now, I think today, like the, the cure for this, is linked to our first episode that we talked Ahsan. about social media. Ahsan. I think one of the cures we can begin is you know, everyone has Facebook now, everyone has Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. You know, a lot of people are scared to come to Karbala, to come to certain religious areas in Iraq or other Arab countries because they think that it's, it's not safe, bombs are there. Last time, it's funny to mention, uh, me and my friend, uh, he's also from the West, he has an app on his iPhone where he goes on the app and it does a random search to anywhere across the world. And the majority that we're getting calls, like accepting our calls, is from the US. Whenever someone picks up, he says, because it shows your IP as Iraq. So it says, oh my God, are you a terrorist? The first question they ask, who are you working with? Are you a terrorist? And it makes us laugh. You know, we're like, no, bro, we're, we're here, it's safe, we're working. It's like, wow, really? To that extent, yeah, people right. are, are, are um, getting out of Islam. I think social media, it, it could be a major factor in reducing social media, can yeah. reduce Islamophobia. Yes. How many Muslims are there on social media? There is, there is millions, there's millions of Muslims. So I'm talking about Muslims in the West. Mm -hmm. Teenagers and youth, Muslims, in, in America, in Canada, in Australia, in Europe, if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram, show a good image of Islam. What do I mean by that? That might be a bit vague. If you have a lot of non-Muslim friends, show them what an ordinary person you are. If you're a doctor, take a picture of you in a hospital with your patients. Right? Show them that you're an ordinary doctor. 
that you love your country, you love your job, you love your work. Mm -hmm. You're an ordinary citizen. You're an average. You're an average American. Yeah. Except you're Muslim. Except you pray. You pray five times a day. You believe in American values. You believe in the American dream. What's the American dream? To live in a nice house with a wife, two kids, and a dog. Right? That's what they say. Well, you don't want the dog. Instead, put a cat. Yeah. Show them that you also want the American dream. You're a normal person. Show them you're a normal American or you're a normal Canadian. You're a normal European and Australian. You have the same aspirations that they do. You have the same ambitions that they do. And you're a good component of society. You're a doctor. You're an engineer. You're a lawyer. You're a teacher. You're a student. You're a, uh, you're a college professor. Show them who you really are. Yeah. Show them your love for your country. Show them your house, your kids, your pets. Show them the place where you work. Right? Let people know that we're normal people. That we like to live. We don't like to kill. We don't like to, you know, commit suicide and take people's lives wow. by, by committing suicide. No, let's show them that through social media. That will play a major role. If I were a non-Muslim and I had a friend, a Muslim friend, and I would look at his, you know, posts on Facebook or tweets on Twitter, and I'll be like, this, this guy's a good person. This person doesn't want to kill me. I'd happily get on a plane with this guy because he's a normal guy. We share the same aspirations, right? That plays a major role. At work, go out there and speak. You know, there's a lot of Muslims, they're passive. They go to work. Yes. They come back, they don't speak to anyone. No, be talkative. Talk to your friends at work. Let them know who you are. Let them yeah. know what your religion is all about. Yeah. Let them know who ISIS is and that they have nothing to do with Islam. If each one of us, let's say there's 3 million Muslims in America, right? Let's say one third of them are children below 10. That's, that, you know, let's take out a million. We'll keep 2 million that are adults, teenagers and adults. If each person talks to at least five people a day about who they are, what Islam is oh, it's all, all about, part. who Muslims are really yeah. are, Muslims are ordinary people, you have a sense of humor, joke with them, show them you know, that you're funny, that you live just like them, right? If you speak to five different people every day, how, many, how much is that? 2 million multiplied by 5 that's 10 million if we do that every day America is 300 million if we talk to 10 million people every day in one month you can reach in all one month we can potentially speak to all of Americans and let them know who we are right it's the little things that count believe me it's the little things that count or a short attractive post on Facebook or Twitter you know, if you have a lot of followers or a lot of friends, they can share it, they, they can like it. Once you like it, everybody else will get to see how magnificent Islam is and you know how beautiful Muslims are. You know what I mean? It's, it's the fact that people sometimes say to them, don't really want to look at what reality is. You know, we talked about the dangers of social media. People don't want to know what dangers are. Absolutely. You know, sometimes it takes, all it takes is one person to destroy the image of an entire religion absolutely if we see you know if we here in Karbala which is majority Shia mm -hmm. if we see a Sunni in Karbala and he's walking in the streets of Karbala in the shops and he uses profanity what are most people gonna say look at Sunnis they use profanity yeah if you see a Sikh at the airport you know doing something crazy you'll say look at all look Sikhs are crazy they do this and that People do the same thing with us. All it takes is one person to destroy the image of an entire race, to yep. destroy the image of an entire religion. Let's be careful out in the West. Let's give a good image of Islam. The way we drive, the way we deal with our co-workers, the way we, uh, the way we deal with um, you know, classmates, so on and so forth. So this is, this is a major factor. Making use of social media and going out there. Giving a good Im image of Islam. There's another point that I'd like to uh, emphasize on, and I think it could be a major solution to uh, 
Islamophobia. And I hope that Vicky, Sahib, and whoever else that wants to know what are the solutions to Islamophobia, I think this is, this is important. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just read this comment? Sure. It's, it's pretty nice. He says, uh, Mo Sahib, he says, when I was six years old, uh, a boy came up to me and said and asked me if I was a terrorist. I remembered feeling unsure and confused about what he meant and I shook my head, I nodded, you know, I shook my head, I don't know what he means by shook my head, and I just walked away. He means like this, like he shook his yeah, head so in disapproval. I did disapproval and walked away. I mean, at the age of six. Right, right. Someone feeling like this. Right. Um, there's something that we could do towards Islamophobia, but it takes a couple of us. We can't all, all do that. Mm -hmm. And that is to go into journalism. Go into journalism. Uh, either have some of, us, some of us go into journalism or have influence on journalism. You see, my dear friends, um, you know, my dear viewers, journalism can play a major role in either the spread of Islamophobia mm -hmm. or reducing Islamophobia. The articles that are being written about Islam mm -hmm. and Muslims, the movies. When I say journalism, journalism includes writing for newspapers, yes. working for news channels, even going into Hollywood, movie making, making movies on YouTube. That's also part of yeah. journalism, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Going into movies that that's not really journalism. Yeah. That's not journalism. That yeah. that's the you know, the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. But journalism is, you know, newspapers and news channels. Mm -hmm. Going into the enter entertainment industry can also have a, can also have an effect as well. I'll I'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we have good writers, that could write for the Washington Post, that could write for the New York Times that could write for the Wall Street Journal about Islam, about Muslims, that give a good image of Islam. How important is that? Yes. How important is that? Okay, we can't go into journalism. I don't expect a lot of you to go into journalism, but we can have an impact on journalism. How? By writing to journalists. Yes. If you see a good article on Islam, good coverage on Islam, write an email. The, the, the author, the, uh, the journalist, usually has his email at the bottom write him an email thank him we don't do that you know who does that jews jews in america if there is any good article not all jews but zionists mm -hmm. if there is any good article on israel they'll see who the author is that journalist and they'll write to him they'll thank him if they see a bad article covering israel They'll send an email of discouragement that we, we didn't like your article and you shouldn't be writing stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And that has an influence. When you see 500 people email you thanking you, you're going to be like, you know what? I'm going to write another article and a third article and a fourth article. But we Muslims were passive. We could care less. We could care less. There could be an article that's pro-Islam. We don't thank the author. There could be an article totally against Islam. We don't write to the author telling him, you know, what are you doing? If we get in that habit, if we mobilize our youth, if we encourage our communities in our majalis, at our Islamic centers, write to the journalists. Encourage them. Mm -hmm. When you see positive coverage of Islam, of Shi'ism, of Iraq, of Afghanistan, anything that contributes positively to Islam, Let's thank these journalists. It will encourage them to do more. You see something bad, write to them. Yeah. Tell them we didn't like your article. That will have a, you know, it will have a major effect. It will have a major effect. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the questions that we got is from Wahid Hassan. It says, in the Quran, there are verses encouraging to kill non-Muslims in Surah Tawbah. How do you explain those? These verses are all contextual. Mm -hmm. They are all contextual. I've given several lectures on this, mm -hmm. on the verses of fighting, or the so-called. I think this, these verses verse. also fuel 
they fuel Islamophobia. they fuel if they are misunderstood yeah if they are misunderstood and i think that some religious scholars have have done a fine job in explaining these verses i personally have given lectures on these verses and what do they mean i'll simply say that these verses if you look at them all when they encourage muslims to fight not non muslims it is all in self defense mm -hmm. All of them in self-defense. Look at the verses. Once I gathered all of the verses, they're about 11 or 12. They're all talking about self-defense. If you're attacked, if they invade your city, if you're kicked out of your homes, if, 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 then fight them back. It is all in self-defense. None of them are offensive. None of these verses say go and attack, uh, you know, civilian non-Muslims or a country next to you that are non-Muslim. Mm -hmm. None. None. Mm -hmm. These verses have all been taken out of context. They should be understood within the context that they were revealed. Yes. And the context that they were revealed was self-defense. Mm -hmm. Now, another question we have from Ammar Hussein. He says, with the rise of Trump, more people seem to be paying attention uh, to anti-Muslim anti hate. What's your opinion regarding this subject? And how can Muslims benefit from this? Um... I think we could benefit by taking advantage of hatred against us mm -hmm. to come out and speak out, to come out and tell people. You know, it all depends on where you are. Don't say that I will leave this to the scholars. This is the job of scholars. This is the job of journalists. This is, a ta this is the job of high profile people like, for example, Mehdi Hassan and others that come out yeah. on TV and are doing a fantastic job. Very fantastic. Yes, they're doing a fantastic job, but so can you. Yeah. Every individual can, it's not can do their job. It's not impossible to, to achieve things in life. If you could speak to people at work, on the bus, at the metro, at Starbucks, uh, you're waiting in line for, for, I don't know, for anything, speak to the people around you. Tell them who you are. Are you a Muslim? Say yes, I'm a Muslim. Do you know what Islam is all about? Do you know what it, is, what it means to be a Muslim? Take advantage of every yeah. opportunity for da'wah. Not to increase Muslims, not to invite people to Muslims. If you could do that, that's great. But number one, to clarify the misconceptions regarding yes. Islam. Do your job, whether it's at work, at school, in the parking lot, at a Starbucks, at the airport, uh, on, on an airplane, or on social media mm -hmm. everyone has social media you don't need to be a high profile person if you have a Twitter account or Facebook account tweet about Islam yes choose good things to tweet about Islam to post about Islam and spread and it will spread it will. on social media it will beautiful things spread quickly you could do your job you don't have to study in Hawza 20 years no. to do something like that so let's take advantage of it people are hating us now Let's show them who we re really are. Let's show them the true side of Islam. Let's take advantage of it. Yes. Let's not be passive. Mm -hmm. our, our problem is that we're passive. Lay people say, you know, this is a job of scholars. Let scholars handle it. Scholars say this is a job of politicians. Politicians say this is a job of the religious institution. And so on and so forth. Each person says it's their job. No, it's their job. No, it's their job. It's all of our job. Yes. Rasulullah says, كُلُّكُمْ رَعْ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَتِهِ you're all, you're all shepherds and you're all responsible over your flocks. Yes. We're all shepherds. We're all responsible. Mm -hmm. So, there's so much that we can do. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Alia Alawi, she says, remember the Prophet, one of, she says, one of the solutions that I think are, are suitable in our times is remember the Prophet since he is our role model. The Prophet was subject to horrible insults and hate crimes in his life. He was patient, remained patient, and tolerant in the face of Islamophobia. Even, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice link. We do thank you for that. You know, she, she linked the past and the present. Absolutely. There's some people that say, you know what? I'm not going to deal with Islamophobia. It's time for me to take my kids and go back home yeah. to Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Afghanistan. I don't know where. That's wrong. If you've, lived, if you've built a family in the U.S., or in the UK or in Australia there's no need for you to go back home stay where you are be patient like my dear sister is saying be patient Asbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu, the Quran says be patient show tolerance 
with difficulties comes good times. Look at the Japanese and what they had to deal with yeah. during World War II yeah. and how they were put in concentration camps. But look at them now today. One of the Japanese developed people, countries. It's a developed country. You know, Japanese people come to the United States without a visa. Yeah. It's reciprocal. Yeah. To that point, one day these countries were nuking each other. They were bombing each other. The U.S. used the nuclear bomb cool. in Hiroshima. The next day they're... Now they're welcome to each other's countries with open doors. You don't even need a visa. Why? Because Japanese people were, were patient. You know Hiroshima I have a friend that went to Hiroshima He went to a museum He says that 30 days He either said 13 or 30 But let's be on the safe side and say 30 not 13 30 days after Hiroshima was nuked They had already set up a school Life was back to normal in Hiroshima They had a school And they went back to learning That's how how much patience they showed. You know, they were nuked for God's sake. Yet yeah, life goes on. Yeah. We in the West, we can't pack our bags and say, we're going to go back. No, we're going to deal with it. Right? Yeah. We're going to deal with Islamophobia. We're not going to go back home. People are afraid of us. We're going to tell them, look, there's nothing to be afraid of. I mean, Al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says, An-nas a'da'u ma jahilu. People fear that which they are ignorant of. Ignorance creates fear. So how do we tackle fear? Through knowledge. Yes. By eradicating ignorance. Yes. By spreading knowledge. And this is one of the points that I'd like to touch upon. Mm -hmm. Strengthening academic centers of Islamic education. Mm -hmm. Islamic studies programs. Islamic studies in yes. the West. By promoting, sponsoring and supporting Islamic studies at universities in the West, there's so much that we could do. Mm -hmm. Because when people come and really study Islam and see that ISIS or Wahhab, Wahhabism is only a minor factor of Islam, Islam is much bigger than mm -hmm. that. Islam has history, Islam has, has art. Islam ruled the world once during the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, I remember in, in first and second year university, there were introduction to Islam and then there's a second stage Islam right. where you know a, a Shia professor or any professor who was delivering that lecture honestly really showed and he did it perfectly uh, Dr. Yaleq at takim he, he, he showed the difference between um, what true Islam is and what uh, you know the Wahhabis and what their ideology is mm. which brings us to the final question we have approximately two minutes uh, to end our show um, Hussam al-Nasri, he says, uh, what are the main differences between Shia Islam and radical Islam? If you can sum it up in, or, you know, just Islam and radical Islam. If you can sum it up in two minutes. Radical Islam. It's Islam is the religion of the Quran mm -hmm. and Prophet Muhammad and Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. Who were sent as a mercy for people. Who were sent to teach through akhlaq, mm -hmm. through ethics, through manners, not by the sword. Those who wanted people to become Muslim through understanding, through acceptance, and not by force, not by coercion. Radical Islam is taking verses literally out of context, like the verses that say kill non-Muslims. And we said these verses are contextualized. They came for self-defense and they had a specific context. Taking these verses out of their context, taking them literally and applying them at a time when they are inapplicable. Yes. Taking things literally. Wanting to go back to the Stone Ages. Not knowing that Islam is for every age and for every time. And for every time and every age, there are different ways to apply Islam. The concepts remain the same, but the applications change. Mm -hmm. The applications change. Mm -hmm. What's funny about this is that the people who uh, are Islamophobic, they have something in common with the people who are extremists because both of them hate Muslims. Both of them 
think Accent. that these, you know, they hate the majority of Muslims. The innocent Muslims who live their daily lives just like, uh, you know, regular Americans or you know, uh, they're American as well. Right. They they do have something in common with radicals who think that everybody is evil and all Muslims, you know, should go to hell except for them. Uh, but we do thank you very much, Sayyidina, for joining us tonight. Right. Hopefully, inshallah, we can continue our discussion tomorrow because I believe today and tomorrow are connected in some way. Uh, but the dear viewers will have to wait and see what tomorrow has to offer. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Hopefully, we continue this. Respective viewers, do stay tuned for tomorrow's episode for we will, inshallah, continue our discussion uh, around uh, such topics uh, that affect our daily life on a daily basis. Uh, affect our lives on a daily basis. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.